All right, you're good. All right. Well, friends, we are in um, workshops dealing with key doctrines of the, uh, really, of the Christian faith, but more directly, uh, the key doctrines of the Evangelical Free Church of America as well. And uh, we're in the doctrine of the person and the work of Jesus. And um, today we are going to begin um, a two-part on the resurrection uh, of, of Jesus. And so the resurrection of Jesus, and, and today we're going to talk about the significance of the resurrection. And the next time we get together, which will actually be next month, the next time we get together for our workshop, we're going to talk about the evidence of the resurrection. So let's pray, and then we'll uh, jump in with our, our content. Father, we thank you so much that your word is truth. Sanctify us in the truth. I pray that whatever knowledge we learned this morning would not puff up, but that it would transform. And that as we consider the significance of this theology, that, that Jesus is alive, that he was raised, uh, that it would give us courage to live our faith, that it would empower us as we seek uh, to follow Jesus, our risen Savior and our Lord. All for his glory. In his name we pray. Amen. All right, friends, so uh, one of the things about the, the resurrection and, and the idea of thinking about the significance of the resurrection, uh, this was brought to my attention in my study uh, by Wayne Grudem in his Systematics Theology. And one of the things that he noted is that oftentimes when we, we get to the theology of Jesus' resurrection, oftentimes we focus on the apologetics of it or, or the argument or the evidence that it really happened. And we think that's important. Uh, because if you can prove that Jesus was raised from the dead, you really prove that Christianity is, is a true religion, You're basically proving everything. So it's important to think about the, the evidence uh, of the resurrection. Uh, but the point that, that Wayne Grudem made was that sometimes when we focus on the evidence of the resurrection, we forget about the significance. The significance of why Jesus had to be Raised not just to prove that he's the Messiah, which is very true, but also for the powerful work that he does in the lives of those who trust in him uh, by, by faith. And so, the idea of Jesus' resurrection is absolutely powerful. And I'll even point out uh, Charles Spurgeon, who is uh, known as the, the Prince of Preachers, uh, was the greatest preacher of the 19th century. Uh, he preached in a time in which many of the preachers around him. We're, we're preaching a liberal gospel, a progressive gospel, um, a, a gospel that was more of a feel-good gospel than, than a gospel rooted in truth. And, and one of the things that, that um, Spurgeon said was he said that the preachers of his time lacked evangelistic power and evangelistic witness uh, because they preached differently than the apostles of Jesus' time. And he said that the most significant difference between uh, the liberal preachers of his day and the apostles was that they did not preach the resurrection. They basically preached, Jesus did good things, said good things, modeled your life after him. But they didn't preach the truth of his resurrection. And he said this about the apostles. The apostles, when they preached, always testified concerning the resurrection of Jesus and the consequential resurrection of the dead. It appears that the Alpha and the omega of their gospel was the testimony that Jesus Christ died and rose from the dead according to the scriptures. So the resurrection is absolutely uh, significant. And oftentimes we say things like, Jesus died for you. But we also have to remember that he also was raised for you. We celebrate Easter once a year, but every Sunday is Resurrection Sunday. The, the, the reason why the church worships on Sunday is to remember the resurrection of Jesus. No resurrection, no Christianity, no new life. And so let's get into the significance of the resurrection. So in your notes, on the first thing, the resurrection of Jesus is significant because it ensures our regeneration. The resurrection ensures our regeneration. And, and you might be asking, okay, what is regeneration? What do you mean by, by that? Okay, so number one, regeneration, what that is, is an act of God in which he imparts to us new spiritual life. So new spiritual life to us. And sometimes this is called you know, born again. 
Like you're, you are born again. And sometimes it's used as a title, I'm a born again Christian, but it's not just a title, it's a reality. You have been born into a new life. And uh, we will get to the doctrine of the Holy Spirit at some point, and we'll go into a deeper dive into this idea of regeneration or, or being born again. But I'll, I'll make a couple of notes, and we've been in First Peter, right? First Peter, uh, verses... Or chapter 1, verse 3, this is what Peter says about the, the role of the resurrection and being regenerated, born into new life. He says, blessed be, and this is in your notes, I believe, yeah, number 2, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to His mercy, He has caused us to be born again to a living hope. How? Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. He has begotten us to new life, actually through the resurrection uh, uh, of Jesus. And then Paul talks about this idea of the Spirit's role of raising Jesus from the dead and raising us into new life in Romans 8, verse 11. Romans 8 is like the key Holy Spirit passage uh, of the Bible, uh, but it also talks about how we are raised to life in Jesus' resurrection. Uh, he says this, and this is also in your notes, uh, Romans 8, verse 11. If the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you. So if God's Spirit raised Jesus from the dead, and oftentimes the, the, the Spirit is, is the instrument of, of Jesus being raised from the dead, if that Spirit dwells in you, who raised Christ Jesus from the dead, will also give you life to your mortal bodies through His Spirit who dwells in you. So this is idea of this connection between Jesus being raised and us in union with Jesus being raised to new life uh, with Him. And so as number three, as I point out number three, without the resurrection of Jesus, if He's just a good man that lived, taught good things, and then died, without the resurrection of Jesus, we are still dead. We're still in a state of sin and condemnation before, before God. And that's why when we talk about well, what is the gospel, uh, we, we don't stop when Jesus died for you. He had to also be raised for you. So we lived the perfect, and we did this when we talked about the um, uh, Jesus is the, the new Adam. He's our representative and our substitute. He lived the perfect life that you can't live. He died the death that you deserve. But he had to be raised so that you might be raised to new life uh, with him. And, and this helps us understand things like uh, 1 Corinthians um, 1, uh, 15 through sin, or 17, where Paul tells uh, the church, and if Christ has not been raised, your, your faith is futile, and you are still in your sins. With no resurrection of Jesus, like, Christianity is not a good liberal religion. And by that I mean just a good, like, like if you just listen to Jesus' wise words. No, it's actually foolishness, and so you shouldn't be confused. The, the apostles never preached that Jesus was just a good teacher. They preached that he was the Messiah that was raised from the dead, and they believed that if Jesus did not was not raised from the dead, they, they knew that, that what they were professing was foolishness, and that we would still be dead in our sins. And in fact, actually, Christians would be the most pitied of all people in the world. And so the resurrection of Jesus here is directly tied to our new spiritual life, this new birth that we have in, in Jesus. And so there's a connection between Jesus' resurrection from the dead and our new life in Christ because we have union with Him, uh, which helps us make sense of things like Ephesians 2, 5 through 6. And so I'm going to read that passage that's in your notes, and then we'll fill in the blanks here in just a moment. But what, what Paul says to the church in Ephesus is, even when we were dead in our trespasses. So we weren't dead, literally, but spiritually, we were dead. We were in the tomb. We are made alive together with Christ. That together aspect is union with Christ. By grace you have been saved. This is where Paul just kind of like gets distracted. <laughs> it just starts about God's grace. And he says, uh, we are made alive together with Christ and raised us up with him and seated us with Him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And so, uh, there's an atemporal kind of aspect to this, and by that I mean is it's outside of time. What Paul is saying is that the historical event of Jesus being raised from the dead, and, and your later on event of having faith in Jesus' resurrection, united you to Christ's resurrection. 
And so when Jesus was raised, that your dead self in the tomb, spiritual tomb, was raised with him. And we'll get to the ascension because it also talks about us being seated with him as well. And we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit today, but more so when we talk about the ascension uh, of Jesus. But, but number four, when we were dead, even not just physically dead, but spiritually dead, God made us alive. And we are raised up with Jesus. And so we have new life uh, with him. And, and oftentimes when we think about the resurrection, usually we think about something to come. And that's true. Uh, the, the full culmination of our resurrection. But what Paul is talking about is that the resurrection life begins now at faith. Like when you have faith in what Jesus did, you, you are now living this, this resurrection life. It's a powerful life. It is going to be fulfilled in, in a full extent um, on the day of, of Christ's return. But it is a, a living hope, as Peter says in 1 Peter that we've been talking about. And it's also a life of power uh, that we have. So, so number five, the same power. The same spiritual power that raised Christ from the dead is actively working in those who have faith in, in Jesus. And, and Paul says this in, in Ephesians 1, uh, verses 19 through 20. And he, he actually calls it immeasurable greatness. He says, what is, the, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power, God's power, towards us who believe, us who have faith, according to the working of his great might, that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. So the same power that, that brought Jesus up from the grave, that is a power that we're not just waiting on, but that we have received. The resurrection power that we have, we don't oftentimes think about um, and rely on. If you are a Christian, if you have faith in Jesus, you have new life, resurrection life. Regenerated life in Christ. The resurrection of Jesus ensures our regeneration, our new life. Uh, next, if you flip the page over, the resurrection of Jesus also is significant because it ensures our, our justification. All right, so regeneration, what was that? We, we talked about that. Well, justification. Uh, what is justification? And number one on this side, justification is the instantaneous legal act of God. So it's instantaneous, it's a legal act of God in which he thinks of our sins as forgiven and Christ's righteousness as belonging to us and then declares us to be righteous in his sight. So our sins are forgiven, Christ's righteousness belongs to us and we are declared to be righteous uh, in God's sight. And like sort of in the theological framework, we oftentimes think of justification as being more so related to Jesus' perfect life and his atoning death. Like he, like that substitute aspect of 2 Corinthians 5 21, he who knew no sin became sin, so that we, by faith, uh, might become the righteousness of God. So usually we think Jesus lived the perfect life, we get his perfection, he died the, the, the sins that we deserve, so our sins go on to him. You guys, if you were here, the imputation, the double imputation, Christ's righteousness is transferred to us, our sin is transferred to him. So we usually think of this idea of justification as, as part of his perfect life and his atoning death, which is absolutely true. Uh, but there's one passage in the Bible that clearly states that our justification is also through his resurrection. And how many times does the Bible have to clearly teach something in order for it to be true? One time. One time. And so it clearly teaches this, and so there is a connection also between his righteousness. And there's other passages that, that, that allude to it. Uh, but that one particular passage is Romans 4, um, verse 25, or 9 of 23 through, through 25. And here what Paul is doing is he's talking about the faith of... Do you guys have handles? Oh, cool. Um, sorry. Uh, what Paul is doing is he's uh, talking about Abraham's righteousness and how it was accredited to him, transferred to him by his faith. So Abraham had faith in God, and God considered Abraham righteous based on his faith. And what Paul is saying is uh, this accredited righteousness that was given to Abraham was not just accounted to him, but it can be accounted to you as well. 
And Paul says this, but those words it was counted to him as righteousness were not written for his sake alone, but for ours also. It will be counted to us who believe in him who raised from the dead Jesus our Lord, who was delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification. So died for our sins and was raised for our justification. No resurrection, no declaration of righteousness. And this is absolutely um, significant. If Jesus only died for our sins, uh, then we actually cannot be fully justified, is what Paul is saying. His being raised from the dead is part of, of what his vindication and also um, our justification. And I'll, I'll explain what I mean by that in, in a second here. Uh, number two, it says when God, what do you say here? We're going to go to 1 Timothy 3.16 to kind of explain this. But what it says is when God raised up Jesus, he declared that he approved Jesus' work of, of redemption, which is interesting. Like at the cross, Jesus says it is finished. So that's true. Uh, but the resurrection, like the resurrection still had uh, to, to the, the, the atonement, uh, I suppose, was finished on the cross. But it, Jesus still had to come out of the tomb. And when God raised up Jesus, basically what was happening was, was God was declaring an approval over Jesus' work uh, of redemption. And um, this, is, this is unique in the sense that when we've talked about like, the Old Testament sacrifices, when we were dealing with substitutionary atonement, the priests had to make sacrifices for themselves because they were sinners, and they had to make sacrifices for the people, and they had to just keep on doing that. It, it was never fully approved once and for all, but with the resurrection of Jesus, complete, approved, absolutely um, finished. And um, 1 Timothy 3.16, I'm going to read it, and then I'll talk a little bit about it, and then the significance of the resurrection and our justification. But 1 Timothy 3.16, which might be the oldest like Christian confession ever, um, so this might be one of their confessionals that they would say, um, that, that Paul either wrote himself or was circulating um, within the church. Uh, but this is uh, what Paul says in 1 Timothy 3.16. He says, Great indeed, we confess, is the mystery of godliness. He, speaking of Jesus, was manifested in the flesh, so first the incarnation, vindicated, or justified, it's actually the same exact word as justified, uh, but it's translated differently on purpose, vindicated by the Spirit, um, and that actually is referring to his resurrection by the Spirit, uh, seen by angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed on in the world, taken up into glory. So the ascension, and the reason why it's kind of confessional is it's the idea of Jesus was incarnated, died on the cross, vindicated, raised into life, and then ascended into heaven. And we, we, we see those things in like the, the Nicene Creed and the Apostles' Creed. Um, so this was probably one of the earliest uh, confessions. But why does it say that Jesus was vindicated? Uh, by the Spirit, why, why would it? Why would this? Why would it use this idea of Jesus being justified? Um, the wages of sin is death, right? One of the reasons why Muslims they they actually don't want they don't believe that Jesus died on the cross. They reject that because they think he was a good prophet. A good prophet can't die on a cross. Like like the science, so they reject that completely, and they reject a number of things about Christianity. Uh, but the reality here is, how can Jesus, who is perfect, die a cursed death? Like the idea, the wages of sin is death. He he must have been guilty. And you'll notice in the New Testament, so much of what goes on in like the court hearings is is building a case that Jesus was innocent because that was significantly important for the Jewish audience. They're like, if someone dies on the cross, they're cursed. They must have done something wrong. He must have been a sinner. Only sinners die on, on the cross. But the idea of the resurrection is a vindication of Jesus' righteousness. It proves he didn't die for his sins. He died for your sins. Right? And so the idea is like, yes, he did die. The wages of sin is death. But he did not stay dead. He was vindicated by the Spirit. Shown justified by, by his um, resurrection. And so that's what that's, that's saying. Uh, but here's the thing, because, number three, because we have been raised, 
with Christ, because we have been raised with Christ, God also declares his approval of us. Um, Ephesians 2, uh, verse 6, and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ uh, Jesus. And so there's an idea here where like, Jesus, without a doubt, proves that, that he certainly never sinned. He vindicated, raised from the dead, but in union with him, we are raised up with him, showing that God fully approves of us as well in our union with Christ, which is very good because when we think about our own lives, we don't even approve of our own lives, but to think of the fact that in union with Christ, we actually, right now, like in the spiritual sense, right now, are seated in approval in the heavenly throne room of God through, through our union with Him, justified, not just by His death, but also by His resurrection. Okay, so the resurrection is significant. It ensures our regeneration, it ensures our justification, and uh, last point here, the resurrection is significant because it ensures that we will receive perfect resurrected bodies. Um, our future is a bodily future, not just a spiritual uh, future. And um, maybe some of this will be talked about in the next session too. Uh, but the Gospels and the book of Acts go to great lengths, great lengths to explain that, that not only was Jesus raised, but he was raised bodily, physically raised, that he had a real material body. He was not just a phantom, he was not just a ghost, but he actually had a human body in his resurrection. He will always have a human body. It's a different body. And in fact, you know, sometimes we wonder, like, why do people not recognize him? And I don't think it was just because he was, like, incognito. I think that, like, they were seeing a glorified body. And so there was things where it was like, I recognize it, but I don't recognize it. And so they, 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 Jesus has this glorified body, a bodily resurrection. You know, it's like Luke 24, when we were back in Luke. He says, see my hands, see my feet. Know that it is I myself. I have hands, I have feet. See me, a spirit does not have flesh and bones. And then he's like, give me some fish. And it's not because he was hungry. He was just showing them. Like, Jesus' glorified body can eat and digest food. Don't explain to me how that all works. But somehow, our future is a body that's physical, that can consume. I don't know what happens after that. But the idea is that we can like still consume food. And, and so our future is a bodily future. And then number two, we're promised that our lowly bodies, these bodies that have been corrupted by sin since the fall of Adam, our lowly bodies are going to be transformed uh, to be like his glorious body. Number two, lowly bodies to glorious bodies. Uh, Philippians 3, 21, where it says, who will transform our lowly bodies to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him to subject all things to himself. And this is really important um, because oh, somewhat of our like popular culture of like heaven, like, like, like even like, you know, like the idea of you're in the clouds with like a heart. Or you become some sort of spiritual being. Uh, that's all rooted in like Neoplatonism, this idea of, of the philosophy of the forms of things are, are the, the material is bad and the spiritual is good. Uh, but ever since the beginning, God created matter, material. And, and when he created the physical world, he didn't say, well, that's not as good as spiritual. He said, it's good. It's very good. And so our future is. You know, sometimes people will think, oh, you know, heaven's going to be great, but I really like to play golf. But you know, but the thing is, is like, there's a physical future. There, there's going to be physical activity. To think that there's not going to be perfect recreation in heaven is to assume that there's going to be some sort of spiritual existence, that the physical reality is all like, I like food. It's going to be, it's going to be such a bummer that we don't get to eat. Or even like, maybe like you need sleep, but maybe you'll be able to take that perfect nap that you've always wanted to take. But like, like the future is a physical future, and some of this is speculation, but we know that our future is physical because Jesus is physical. He is a physical human, truly human, truly God for all eternity. And what's fascinating is that we will be like him physically uh, with, with bodies. 
And so this, this helps us put aside from our mind some misconceptions about what heaven is going to be like when we realize there is a physical existence, a new heaven, and a new earth. Right? That's what the Bible says, a physical future. And, uh, and we can know that this is going to be the case uh, because uh, there's a couple passages down here in, in 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15, the main resurrection chapter of the Bible, uh, it talks about Jesus being the first fruit of our future resurrection. And, it says, and Paul says this, but in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruit of those who have fallen asleep. So he's trying to encourage the Corinthians that, that yes, because like, some of them were kind of concerned, but like, they, maybe they thought that, that the resurrection of the dead was supposed to happen immediately, but it wasn't happening, and they had loved ones that had died. But he's telling them, no, you can know that the resurrection will take place. The first fruits have already proven that. What are our first fruits? It's the first, the fruits that grow. Basically showing your investment in the planting and the watering is going to pay off. When you see those first fruits start to grow, you're like, oh, you can know there's more fruit to come. And typically, the first fruit show you the quality of the fruit to come. And, and Jesus' physical body, this glorified body, is showing us that we have something incredible coming. Physically. Yet, yeah, Christ is the first fruit. And we are the fruit, and there's a guarantee that there is fruit uh, to come. And so, 1 Corinthians 5, uh, 40, 15, 42 says, So it is with the resurrection of the dead. What is sown is perishable. What is raised is imperishable. And so that's that idea of showing the death and the resurrection. Like Jesus was like a seed buried into the ground with his death. Yet a bountiful, bountiful harvest is coming. He is the first fruit to come. And then there's going to be a bunch of fruit um, to follow. The land is fertile. The resurrection, uh, our resurrection is coming. And I'm actually done. So we're going to be able to do some Q&A here in, in just a, a minute. But let me just thank God in prayer. And then we can do our Q&A. And people can... Leave if they need to leave um, or stick around for more questions. God, we are thankful that we know that you were raised, and the significance of that is incredible. That because you are raised, we are raised to new life. Because you are raised, we were vindicated by your resurrection, we are declared righteous, being united with you in your resurrection. And we know that you are the first fruits of our resurrection, too. And so we long and look forward to a perfect, eternal future in a physical realm that is perfect. It's hard to even imagine, but we trust in it. And we live our lives now in the light of the life to come, uh, glorifying you and, and calling others to be raised with you by faith. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right.